Hello, everyone. My name is Deborah Yashar, and I'm a, the director of Pierce, the Prince Institute for International and Regional Studies, and also a professor in the politics department and in SPIA. It's really a pleasure to welcome you all today to the Cyril Black International Book Forum. I was just saying that it's actually been a while since we've been able to gather in person for this forum given COVID, and so it's a particular pleasure um, to see you all for this forum in person uh, to commemorate Cyril Black. Cyril Black was a, a very distinguished faculty member here at Princeton, a scholar of incredible uh, um, uh, importance, particularly as I'll say in Russia and the Soviet Union, and also a public servant. My understanding is that he lived from 1915, 1915 to 1989. And I wanted to say a few words about him because at Princeton, um, Cyril Black, and actually everybody here calls him Cy Black. I never met him, but I'm just going to say Cy Black if that's okay, was the James S. McDonald Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs. And he was on the faculty for 50 years. He was also the director of Princeton Center for International Studies for 17 years, from 1968 to 1985. And why is that relevant today? Because CIS, the Center for International Studies, is actually the precursor to Pierce, which was founded in 2003 from CIS to, uh, to Pierce. Cy Black's scholarship and teaching was wide ranging. Um, especially focused, as I said, on Russia and the Soviet Union. And indeed, if you look online, both um, AHA and the New York Times um, have cited that in 1946, he inaugurated here at Princeton actually the study of Russian history for undergraduates with a course he continued to teach until the 1970s, so both courses on, on Russia in particular, as well as courses on revolution and modernization. It also turns out that in addition to being a distinguished professor, um, both in terms of teaching and his scholarship, he also was a public servant. He served for the State Department during World War II, taking a leave of absence from Princeton uh, to serve during the war. So we are so pleased and honored to be able to host this particular book forum. And I wanna pause for a moment to acknowledge that, he, that we have two family members from the Black family who are here with us today, his son, James Black, and his daughter-in-law, Martha Mahaley Black. Can we please just give them a warm welcome? And they are the two who are, who are smiling but who didn't clap, who, who are right here um, in front. <laughs> Um, so it's really a pleasure to host this event for all the reasons that I said, and particularly important that today we are hosting a, um, an event that is focused on the very things that were so near and dear and important to him, which is to focus on the current war in Ukraine. So the focus could not be more important, the topic couldn't be more relevant to his scholarship, and we are so pleased today to have two leading experts of the region to speak to us about, um, about this particular topic. And here I'd like to welcome a very warm welcome to Gwendolyn Sasa, who is visiting Princeton. She just arrived yesterday from Europe and we are so delighted to host you today. She is the director of the Center for East European and International Studies, Zoisa, is that how you pronounce it? Um, based in Berlin, which was established in 2016. So she's the founding director of this particular center. She is also the Einstein Professor for the Comparative Study of Democracy and Authoritarianism at Humboldt University, which by the way, we also have a strategic partnership with, with Humboldt, so that is really nice. And previously, she was a professor of comparative politics at the University of Oxford, where she received a Teaching Excellence Award in 2009. So in the same spirit that, that Cy Black was an incredible scholar and also a phenomenal teacher, we have both an incredible scholar and a phenomenal teacher in our midst. Her research has concentrated on different dimensions of regime change, with a particular emphasis on the post-communist region. And I just want to mention two books here, one of which is the focus of the talk, the first is The Crimea Question, Identity, Transition, and Conflict, which was published um, by Harvard University Press and won the Alexander Nova Prize of the British Association for Slavonic and East European Studies. And the second book that I want to highlight is the one um, that is the focus of today's talk, Russia's War Against Ukraine, which just came out in English at the end of 2023. And Mark, if you wouldn't mind just picking up the book, which is right there. And by the way, we have copies of the book outside. Um, Labyrinth is here uh, with a book for those who I'm sure will be interested. 
which provides an analysis of the background to the war, an account of the course of the war itself, and a timely reflection on what its consequences will be. So Gwen will speak with us for about 35 or 40 minutes, more, more or less, and then she'll be followed by our, our, uh, our colleague and friend, Mark Beisinger, who is a former director of Pierce, but also the Henry W. Putnam professor, who also has an illustrious career. And here I'll also only mention two books. One is Nationalist Mobilization and the Collapse of the Soviet State, and then more recently, the prize-winning uh, book, The Revolu Revolutionary City, Urbanization, and the global state. So Mark will speak afterwards as the discussant for around 12 minutes or so, and then finally we will have the Q&A. So again, warm welcome for Gwen. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't think I need this. I think I have this. If I Does this work? Or better here. Thank you very much, Deborah, for the Kind, kind words of welcome, and thank you very much. It's a huge honor to be invited here to, to speak about um, this book as part of this annual book forum. It really, really means a lot, and it's also nice to be back at Princeton. It's been a few years, so uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, and what I thought I'd, I'd do in, in the time I've got is I walk you a little bit through the book. Um, I'm not assuming that you've all read it or intend to read it, but maybe that helps the discussion afterwards. Um, and let me maybe start by saying this is a book I never intended to write. So in many ways, it's not a typical academic book at all. Um, I think as the title suggests, it's a rather tragic moment that made this um, book come about. I have done work on uh, Ukraine and a little bit on Russia for many years, but I never thought of writing a book in this way and in this kind of moment, of course. Um, but then when the full-scale invasion started, a German publisher actually approached me um, literally days after the full-scale invasion started in February 2022 and said, would you like to write a book? And I said, no. Um, and uh, if you write it now, we could have it out for the Frankfurt Book Fair in, uh, in October. And I said that was so wrong and I wouldn't do it. And then I thought about it again and it's, in, it's, a, it's a nice German publisher and it's a particular series, a series of very slim books. In English, it looks a little bigger. I think they produced it differently, but it's still a very small book. Um, uh, and uh, it's in a series that's written by academics, but for a non-academic audience primarily. Um, and that is exactly also what it has stayed in the English translation, which I did myself and revised and extended the book a little bit, because for the German edition, it was a task to get everything for some reason into 123 pages. I don't know why, but that's the format of this, season, of this uh, series. And then when it was out in, in German, I realized, and the reason why I did it was because maybe also the center I run in Berlin um, tries um, fairly hard to communicate beyond narrow uh, research-focused or academic circles. And this book has, at least in the German context, given me a certain platform to do this and, and hopefully reach, um, at least compared to earlier academic writing of mine, a wider audience, obviously still a select or interested audience but it has um, enabled a different kind of discussion. And then, because I normally don't write books in German, and I'm too socialized into academic writing in English, I wanted it out in English as well. And the publisher said, Polity said, yes, we do it. We do it relatively fast, but you have to do it yourself, which sort of suited me, but was a strange exercise too. So I never translate myself either into German or from German into English. And by then, of course, the war was already at a different, somewhat different stage as well. Um, for those of you who have looked at it, and I'll talk a little bit about it at the moment, it's not a book that aims to detail every stage in, every, um, in a lot of detail. But of course, um, it evolves, and so the English edition is already a bit different from the German one. Now the German one is going into its third edition, which I'll have to rewrite a bit, and then there are other translations out there. So it's also not a book, and it's just a, in the sense of an academic book, you write and then it's there, and that's it, and you, sh you close a chapter. So it's also... It'll be, I think, with me for a long time, but that's okay. So what am I trying to do? I start with, and it's an important um, aspect, I think, of the book. It is partly about also terminology. And as you will see, I called it Russia's War Against Ukraine. Um, this is a very deliberate title um, because this war is about uh, the destruction of the Ukrainian state and the Ukrainian nation. And it is not a Ukraine war, as we, I'm not quite sure how the American media mostly report about it, but 
definitely in, in Europe, it's a term that you still hear every day, that it's the Ukraine war, or even in the Ukraine crisis. And that's also the language that Russia uses and deliberately uses. So that, to, to my mind, disguises what this war is really about. So it's really against the Ukrainian state and the Ukrainian nation. And the book also deals with some misconceptions, mostly misconceptions around um, Ukraine. And it started from, and at its heart, are two main questions. And one is, why this war and why now? When I say now, it, I really mean since 2014, because I think the full-scale invasion came as a surprise to, to many who were maybe not looking so closely at the region. But clearly, this war started in 2014 with the occupation and annexation of Crimea. Um, what is a war if not the annexation of territory? But the label war was often not used, um, not so much in scholarship, um, and also, interestingly enough, and definitely not so much in politics um, and in policymaking circles. In fact, you often had the opposite. Yes, it was against international law, but is there not something that makes Crimea more Russian than, than Ukrainian? So this came, I think, as a surprise to many. For those of us who have studied Ukraine and Russia for a long time, I think it wasn't as big a surprise, although I don't want to, intend, I don't, don't want to say that I predicted or I would have predicted a war of these dimensions. I think that is also part of um, academic honesty. Many people now seem to have known everything that it would uh, end up like this. And those of us who looked quite closely, I, I don't think I could have imagined a, a war of these, these dimensions. And the second big question, I think, on people's minds, in particular in 2022, but maybe still today, well, how to explain Ukraine's resistance? Many thought, um, again, scholars as well as um, policymakers and many intelligence services that it would be over in a few days. And the man in the Kremlin certainly thought the same. Uh, the focus in the book is really on Ukrainian politics and even more so on society. Um, and I also talk about Russian politics and society, but the focus is on, on Ukraine. And I think that's where maybe most of the misconceptions or even uh, just a gap in, in knowledge and not so much in scholarship, but in scholarship and how it was perhaps seen or not seen lies. And I will also, I will end with a few modest attempts at, <clears throat> at an outlook and implications, but obviously the biggest question, how will this end? I say right away, I cannot um, answer. So a brief look at the um, structure. It's very straightforward. As a chapter, why this war, why now? I'll tell you how I go about answering this. Uh, then I have uh, two chapters on themes, which I think are fundamentally important to understand uh, Ukrainian politics and in particular Ukrainian society. And just as an aside, I just already mentioned, I was um, reminded of um, Cyril Black's book, the edited volume, The Transformation of Russian Society, which I read, among other books, um, as an MSc student at the LSE. And I like that emphasis on society and looking again at the page of uh, the contents page, you could have, have a lot of similar questions that that book post asked um, about Ukraine or Russia now in a different context, but probably with more or less the same themes that you want to explore. And I find that around these themes of independence, territory, protest, and transformation are some of the things that might have got um, lost uh, when looking at Eastern Europe or Ukraine in particular. Then I have a chapter on Russia. What kind of a system is it? Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a moment, but the keywords here say it probably already. And then I take a more chronological approach through the three stages of this war. The first stage from 2014 um, onwards, the annexation of Crimea. The second stage also starting in 2014, the war in Donbass. And then the third stage, um, start of the, the full-scale invasion in February 2022. And ending with a few consequences of the war, which we can already see. Others we probably won't see for some time. Now, the three phases of the war, and I've sort of illustrated here with uh, kind of key images of these two, uh, of these three uh, phases. Um, I want to just emphasize that around the annexation of Crimea, one common misconception, maybe not to you in this room, but I think to many I try to address with my book, is this but that I mentioned, already mentioned. Yes, um, the annexation was a breach of international law, but does Crimea not necessarily somehow belong to Ukraine, that that's quite um, deeply rooted in, I think, um, uh, public and imagination. And if you look more closely at this, um, this is primarily due to, I would argue, and I argue in the book, um, of our, or our collective, maybe Western, 
view that is very influenced by Russian imperial and a Russian imperial lens, which reflects onto Western societies or Western perspectives. So why would we think that um, a period, several centuries of Russian rule in Crimea counts more or makes it more of a Russian Crimea than several hundred years of Crimean Tatar rule, partly on the Ottoman rule beforehand. This is not an argument or since 1954 in the Soviet Union when Crimea was part of an administrative act transferred to the Ukrainian Soviet Republic. So why does 1954 to 91 or 91 till now uh, count less? This is not an argument about counting the years and who has more of a claim. Before the Crimean Tatars, there were many other peoples settling in this um, in Crimea, in this peninsula. It's also to do with its location. Um, but it's more an argument about why we see certain periods as more important than others. And that is clearly shaped by narratives that we have um, also been kind of um, uh, uh, consuming uh, through uh, Russian historiography, Russian literature, that is very much tied to the beauty of the landscape of Crimea and so on. So I think this is a moment where we also reflect on, on those things that, that stick more. Um, it's not an argument about arguing who has more right um, or, or less of a right to Crimea. That question is settled with, if we uphold international law, it's part of Ukraine as of 1991, and that's the end of the story. But nevertheless, the discourse around it clearly is shaped by much longer historical um, and cultural legacies. So the war in Donbass um, that follows, and you can just about made up, make out maybe one of the, the bridges that was one of the few connecting parts between the two parts of the Donbass um, controlled by Ukraine and, and by um, effectively Russia since 2014, um, would not, I argue, um, have happened without the annexation of Crimea just before. But the dynamics there are somewhat different, but maybe not as different um, from uh, Crimea as it sometimes seems. Uh, even the European Court on Human Rights has established that since early May, when a fake referendum was held in these, held in these parts of Donetsk and Luhansk in Eastern, Eastern Ukraine, Russia was directly responsible and in control. That means it only leaves um, maybe three weeks where the situation is unclear. And there are separatists um, uh, trying to achieve different things at this time in those parts of not the whole regions of parts of Donetsk and Luhansk, um, but Russia is involved from the word go and from at least, um, in, that's how the court framed it, at least from that moment it's, it's um, controlled by, by Russia. So this is very much part of the same war of U Russia against Ukraine. And then the pictures of the night of the 24th of February when um, uh, <coughs> Kiev looked, looked like this and the pictures haven't changed much since. So why, why this war? And um, I bring up all points right away. Um, those of you who know um, a book, or actually an article by Alexander Dallin, um, I try to um, not, not, of course, imitate him, but I was very <coughs> impressed about his analysis of the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. I'm also impressed by, by your um, argument. Um, but what he, uh, what he did is he, he constructed a list um, and he described various processes that made the collapse of the Soviet Union more likely. And they were, for example, loosening of controls, a spread of corruption. So there were erosion of certain institutions. So it was dynamic processes. And against that backdrop, he said Gorbachev was the catalyst who then actually had a, well, an, obviously an important effect. And I thought about it similarly here for the war. So Putin as a catalyst, often I get the question, does that not make his role seem too small. I mean, a catalyst is pretty important. I don't think it makes it very small, but it puts the emphasis on something else. So it's also, again, about partly about terminology. And maybe that um, was terminology that I, I heard more in, in, in Germany. I don't, I don't know to what extent it was used here. Many people called it Putin's war initially. And the argument here is that it's, that's too simple. Clearly, Putin plays an important role in an authoritarian system. How could he not? Uh, but I have highlighted the two dimensions I think are most important as the axis um, over which this war is fought. And I think it's about the strengthening of the Russian authoritarian system, which has an inbuilt imperial um, claim, uh, and uh, democratizing and uh, uh, democratizing Ukraine that is increasingly um, turning or has turned westward. And then within both of these um, categories related to Russia and to Ukraine, 
uh, the two other processes on the Russian side, um, I think the process of and the extent to which Russian society has been penetrated with state-sponsored memory politics and propaganda for many years has prepared society um, to do for what it's doing now, namely exactly next to nothing, because it cannot anymore, and it also is depoliticized for the most part. Um, and on the Ukrainian side, I think a strengthening of a civic identity as opposed to a more narrow ethno-linguistic identity that many think is so important in Ukraine, um, I think explains part of the, the democratization, the westward orientation, and I say it right away, also the, the resistance, not just military resistance, but also civilian resistance that we have seen since uh, 2022. And then there are two um, dimensions or processes uh, on the international level and increasing over many years and increasing discrepancies clearly between Western and Russian security perceptions that could not be brought together, or maybe one didn't try hard enough. Um, and also growing, maybe more importantly, growing contradictions in Western policy towards Russia. And there, of course, um, one key example, not the only one, but one key example is the German policy on Nord Stream. Um, on the one hand, uh, this great dependency on, on Russian gas in particular, and then that clearly signaled to the Kremlin that that would take precedent over, over anything to do with sanctions in reaction to the annexation of Crimea or the war in, in Donbass. And then the final dimension I think that's important is the fact that it is a war that escalates through these different stages is also um, part of an, of, a, of an explanation of why and why, why now. But the key thing, I think, is that um, uh, Russia, and in particular the Russian leadership, try to use a certain time window as well um, to prevent Ukraine from finally um, orienting itself somewhere else. So if we look at Russian authoritarianism, and maybe the picture um, sums up a bit um, uh, what is part of, not the whole thing, but part of, of the system, I emphasize in the book that a lot of... Um, Kind of the features of the Russian political system since 1991 are actually more continuities than breaks. So um, again, maybe more from a European, also from a German perspective, you often hear the argument, oh, there was Putin one, and then there was Putin two, and then there's certain speeches where where that gets, uh, where he spoke in the German parliament, or where he spoke at the Munich Security Conference uh, some years later. But if you look at trends more closely, if you even look at the constitution of 1993, um, this is already a constitution that uh, enables uh, a lot of the things that follow. So I see more continuities than, than real breaks. One can say, of course, with hindsight, that's always easier. But this was already a constitution under President Yeltsin at the time that had far-reaching uh, prerogatives of the president and far-reaching veto rights. He didn't use all of them, but he was also the, the president who bombarded parliament when they didn't um, vote the way he, he wanted. So there is... A starting point, which the, the, the experimenting, experimenting with democracy is a very short period in, in, in Russia. And what we saw since is really Putin until at least now probably 2013, 30, probably longer, um, or possibly longer. We don't know. Probably a lot of it depends on how this war will end. Um, and it's a system that has become, I think, continuously more personalized, more centralized. It has a clear focus on self-preservation that becomes more and more important. Paradoxically, also a higher risk with this, uh, with this kind of a war. I'm sure that was not entirely part of the calculation. Uh, what happened under Putin was uh, pushing back um, oligarchs, so economic interest groups, replacing them with what is called the siloviki, so representatives of the security sector in particular. And it's a system that's been characterized by increasing repression, media control, what we also see is a close link between domestic and foreign policy. You can say, well, that is always the case everywhere and not only in authoritarian systems. But here it's very clearly and closely linked to the dynamics within the system. So um, how, for example, um, annexing Crimea so as a foreign policy act was immediately used for um, uh, showing up domestic legitimacy of the system. So um, there's a very, very close link in that regard. And I already mentioned the growing depoliticization of society and an inherent imperialism. So this is also nothing new if we think back to the early 90s even. When we think of um, uh, um, wars in Georgia, for example, if we think of Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Transnistria, Nagorno-Karabakh, most of them have come back again over time. 
um, they didn't feature very much on the Western mental map. And the sentence, uh, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union was by large peaceful, or was a peaceful collapse, um, I think also says a lot about how um, many in the West see this region, because if you calculate it all together, there are hundreds of thousands of deads displaced and so on, but these parts of the region, they seem small because we hadn't really looked at them so much beforehand, rather than that they're not actually wars and ongoing wars and, and nothing is frozen very much, so that's how they are presented. If we look at um, Ukraine, and I just want to highlight a few things I emphasize in the book, I think one moment that doesn't get enough attention and is important to understand Ukraine and Ukraine today is the referendum on independence. So just before the Soviet Union collapses on the 1st of December 1991, um, the then Ukrainian leadership does something quite clever. So there's a referendum on, on the independence of Ukraine. Independence had already been declared by parliament and a year earlier, sovereignty had been declared. So it was this, um, for our terminology, somewhat strange um, uh, but in the Soviet logic, logical uh, way of, of um, sort of uh, sequencing it. But in this referendum on independence, a vast majority of um, citizens of the then Soviet Union in the Ukrainian Soviet Republic votes for independence. So um, over 90% vote yes, and way over 80% take part. And the participation, the turnout in the southern and eastern regions, which in Many people's perceptions don't want to be part of Ukraine or never really wanted to be Ukraine um, are almost equally high. So there are votes in, for independence of between 75 and over 80 percent. Turnout is also uh, almost as high as, as, as in, in Western regions. And even in Crimea, um, uh, there's a majority, a, a slim up majority. So 54 percent say they want to be part of an independent Ukraine. But nevertheless, um, and close to 70% take part. So even the region that has been not so long part of the Ukrainian Soviet um, the Republic votes in favor of that. And people might have thought of independence in many different ways. And what it even meant was probably also not clear to, to everybody what it could mean. But it's the beginning, I argue, in the book of um, a sense of the civic identities that very different parts of, of Ukraine make up this nation and this state, despite its, or because of, its historical diversity. Um, Crimea, and this is, I will not go into this too much because otherwise I talk too long. I wrote my, my PhD dissertation about this and that merged into that book. Uh, Crimea was an important territorial challenge, the main challenge for Ukraine in the early 1990s. Um, then it was a challenge for the Ukrainian state. In 2014, it was not. Um, so the idea that uh, Russia reacted to something happening in Crimea, that Crimeans wanted to be part of Russia in 2014 or saw their rights in any way stifled, that's just a myth and that's propaganda. So if you look at a close chronology, although I think the longer we move away from 2014, that argument also is one that features fairly prominently, I think, in public um, discourse, that there were so many in Crimea that wanted to be part of Russia. In, in the early 1990s, that was unclear, and there was mobilization in Crimea. There was, uh, there, were, um, there was a movement that tried to gain more autonomy, then it was called independence for Crimea, um, and they also reached out to Russia, but Yeltsin at the time did not respond, um, so that didn't go anywhere. And this challenge at the time was um, managed, sometimes by default, sometimes by design, and it was solved by, on the one hand, those movements taking themselves apart. The fact that Crimea is also quite a um, diverse and multi-ethnic place is also the Crimean Tatars who returned from their places of deportation. So it wasn't a clear-cut issue of sort of Russians against Ukrainians or something like that. And primarily, I argue in, in that other book, um, also a process of giving this region an autonomy status, which in the end is really weak. But the Ukrainian constitution since 96 um, has lived quite comfortably with the contradiction of saying at the beginning, uh, Ukraine um, uh, is a unitary state, and then comes Article 10 as the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. Um, and it doesn't have many rights, but already the status can be quite important and symbols matter. But the fact that there was a negotiation over this process the whole time, I would argue, took a lot of the conflict potential out, different types of conflict that could have happened at the time. So this was a conflict, um, conflictual period, 
but the run up to 2014 was not. Uh, Crime the Crimean population was as surprised by the Russian um, uh, um, special troops coming in as the rest of um, the Russian population in Russia and uh, the West. In hindsight, sometimes the chronology seems to, to, to be a bit wonky. Um, there's a number of other misconceptions which um, shape perceptions of Ukraine. And that is uh, the depiction of an east-west divide based on Russians and Ukrainians, Russian speakers and Ukrainian speakers, and also so-called pro-Russian parties um, that were prominent in the south and east of the country. Um, in reality, and there is a lot of research um, on that, uh, language was never a, an issue that made for conflict in everyday interactions. Um, now things are changing, and there's no comprehensive research possible on that yet. After this war, I think there will be a lot fewer Russian speakers in uh, Ukraine. But in the south and east, uh, you have a lot of bilingual um, Ukrainian citizens, always had, and increasingly so. And people vary and varied in terms of the context in which they use the language. So maybe they use one at home and one at work or they use two as part of the same conversation in the street. So it also, I think, has a lot to do with how from outside it was seen that if you, and maybe it's something to do, I know Eastern Europe best, but I'm sure it happens also in other um, regions of the world. If we look in from outside and we see ethnic differences, we think conflict um, or language differences, and we think that has to be a conflictual um, issue. In, in fact, it also was around election time used by Ukrainian politicians, um, but it was not the main dividing line, as also East and West were, were not um, uh, divided on being part of the Ukrainian state. There were a lot of different interests that varied, and also economic interests that vary, and different parties stood in different parts of the country. Um, they were hardly ever pro-Russian parties. Um, they were far too savvy in terms of their economic interests, and they knew they wanted to have links to Russia, but also to uh, to the West of the EU. Um, so the, the label pro-Russian also confuses what they were ultimately about. In terms of identities, um, we can see through over, over years of, in particular, opinion poll research, that this notion of a civic identity tied to the polity of Ukraine, the state of Ukraine, had become the predominant category. So if you give people um, as far as it's possible to get at that with um, survey instruments. If you give people lots of different um, choices, and also not just ethnic and civic ones, but also other social identities, then for um, uh, many years already, um, uh, definitely from, I mean, I, I think I see the shift for, to a majority identifying as, as Ukrainian citizens uh, around 2017, 18, but already before that, it is a prominent identity category since then, it's, at least in the research I know, um, always the predominant one. It doesn't mean that there aren't any others. And if you force people to make a choice, it also artificially says one above others. But you may may obviously um, vary your identity um, depending on, on the context, as we all do. So I want to then highlight one thing that I move on into in the next chapter that I think is very important to understand um, Ukrainian society. And that's that it is a, a country, a society that has gone even since, well, the first one here is from 1990s, so even just before the breakup of the Soviet Union, um, till now, through various cycles of mass mobilization, mass protest. And um, mass protest in general is, is fairly rare, that a country goes through this several times within the space of very few years, and initially tens of thousands, and later on hundreds of thousands of people come into the street, um, you can see here also some the part of the aesthetic even is the same as well from 1990 with this tent city in the in the in the center of, of, of Kiev. I think that does something to society. And I think we still need to, and myself included, um, think of, of ways of actually capturing that in research. So I think this we, these repeated cycles of what that does to a society, I think um, uh, we probably don't understand enough of it yet, but we can see here this is a um, in that sense, as a social scientist, I would say a perfect case to, to study this. You will probably mm, remember these images more than the earlier ones, 2004, the Orange Revolution, uh, which started over electoral manipulation, um, and the Euromaidan, or as it's known in Ukraine, the Revolution of Dignity, uh, which uh, the trigger of which was the then president not signing an association agreement with the EU, 
which however is, is probably a too technical issue to really capture what the process, uh, protest was about. Probably very few people know exactly what that agreement contained, but it was, as in the previous rounds, um, a protest against a corrupt government. And at the time, often this protest, the last one, the Euromaidan, is seen as, a, as an example of that the country is split. But at the beginning of it, if you look at the popularity of the then president, Yanukovych, he was as unpopular in the south and east of the country as in the in the west. So this was again, the starting point was one against a, a corrupt um, leadership and sort of hopes for something else. So what are um, potential effects of, of mass protests? And I see we, I think we see all of them in Ukraine. On the one hand, it really, um, of course, politicizes uh, society. There are many hopes, but also then disappointments if um, uh, kind of policies cannot or do not change what um, what maybe incoming leaders promised. Um, very importantly, it leads to new networks and reinforces um, uh, net, net, existing networks, networks not only among activists, but also among wider parts of society. As I mentioned already, they bring about or brought about changes in government, but they also in, subsequently led to infighting and stalled reforms. And I think they, and I argue this in the book, um, they are an important element of strengthening the sense of a civic identity of being a citizen of, of um, the Ukrainian state. Uh, what it did is, it's, it's on the one hand, strengthening civil society is one aspect, but I think one aspect that has that was overlooked for a long time, beyond that, it has, at least it's tied to how much of it is due to the protests, I can't say. It has led, or partly led to, um, uh, a greater emphasis on on volunteering. So uh, many more Ukrainian citizens have volunteered for all kinds of different things, and this is now before the full-scale invasion. What we see since is that this is taken to an extreme, and I suppose the war context makes that necessary. Um, but um, kind of just as an aside, we can discuss this later. If you look in opinion polls, what are the three most trusted institutions um, already for several years before 2022. Um, the armed forces were always number one. The president sometimes, sometimes the church was high. Um, and at least number three, volunteers. Um, civil society organizations as well in the top tier three. But then volunteers is a strange sense of an institution that you trust. <laughs> so so that um, indicates, I think, something, something important or interesting going on in Ukraine. And also, um, with regard to Ukraine, these protests made the EU an increasingly important reference point for its reforms and for its, its orientation. But then, um, on the sort of more tragic side, um, these protests are also, in particular, the last ones, um, or the last two, 2004 and 2013 14, directly linked to Russia's reaction um, and as a, as a signal that this is the moment when you can perhaps still stop a certain process. So, the annexation of Crimea the war in Donbass and the full-scale invasion um, uh, are also um, directly linked to these processes. I want to just, and you don't need to look too much at the details, um, just want to show you some colorful images. As I said, the east-west division of Ukraine is too simple the way it was presented. Where we did see it, um, but for, for various reasons, is at the national level in elections and nowhere more clearly than in presidential elections. Here are the examples from 2004 and 2010. You, so you can clearly see that in the runoff, the, um, the country seems divided. But if you go one level below that um, and look at the local elections, already 2015, Ukraine looks quite literally a lot more colorful. And also parties that are, for example, founded in, in uh, the far west of the country are often number two on the, in the local councils in the east. So this does not mm, quite um, match the image that maybe uh, we pick up most when we look only at the national level or the, the runoff between two presidents. And in 2019, as you might remember, this happens. So then also at the national level in presidential elections, that divide goes away. I mean, it goes away to a surprising um, extent and only in one region in the West um, does the uh, uh, incumbent uh, Poroshenko still win. The rest is taken by, by Zelensky, the current president. So I don't know if you can see this well at the at the back. Um, I want to briefly pick up on this point about um, trends in society um, that, that are related to a civic duty, to vote, to protest, to engage, but also I think to this wider notion of volunteering. 
been involved in an, a project which um, uh, implemented a panel survey, so asking the same people the same questions um, several times. The um, project was called Mobilize with um, uh, some colleagues at the University of Manchester and, and um, other partners. And what we see, I just want to highlight um, the, the, the middle um, uh, results here. You can see a, a slight rise in, in all of these things, duty to vote, um, the highest rise, duty to engage, meaning civil society in this case, but also duty to protest. So you see um, kind of through opinion poll data now illustrated what I just um, tried to, to describe before. If we move this forward and we do it a few more, but not panel surveys um, since uh, also the, the, the start of the um, uh, full-scale invasion, we see that that civic engagement has, has risen even more. And these are examples of how people engage. Um, but then you can say, well, in a war context, maybe that is less surprising. But I think it was prepared by and it could kick in so quickly because of the processes that uh, preceded it. And you can see the ways in which uh, people engage now. And you see something as well, oops, something has gone wrong a little with the lines, but the key line is the one at the top. This is a, is a typical question um, in, in surveys, uh, what kind of a political system people prefer more? Is it democracy? Does it not matter? Is it more um, an authoritarian type of system? And what has been a clear trend, and actually a trend that is in, a, in its dimensions surprising also compared to other European countries um, and probably beyond that, because it also covers um, uh, the uh, COVID period, is, and here's the cutoff 2022, um, that that uh, support for the statement democracy is preferably to, preferable to any other kind of government um, has a clear um, increase here. And that's, that's quite a um, noteworthy one, whereas the others are dropping off or, or staying stable. And similarly, um, we can see that uh, Ukrainians have not forgotten that they protested and they might do so again. So there's a drop um, around the start of the full-scale invasion, but then, and it has sort of recovered even more since. So the, the image of that at the moment, Ukrainian politics are very streamlined, but society um, keeps valuing the, the right and perhaps the duty to, to protest. So where we are, are we in this war? This is uh, on, the, on the left, it's uh, the beginning of the full-scale invasion. And as of yesterday, uh, we can see um, uh, this map here, um, there were new attacks in the north, but most of the uh, war activities are currently focused in, in the eastern regions where the situation is getting increasingly difficult for Ukraine. What that image and those images and the reporting does not completely convey is that the dimensions in the south have often have been different. And in particular, um, uh, military action in the Black Sea region and around Crimea is not so clear cut in, in Russia's um, favor. But at the moment, it's concentrated in the East, a war of attrition. Um, and we probably have the images in our, in our heads. So briefly to conclude in terms of the outlook and implications, um, I think the sad conclusion is that it's um, a long war, war. And I put an unless there. And I think one of the um, factors on the horizon is, as you all well understand, um, the US elections. And if U.S. military assistance, in particular military, but also financial assistance to Ukraine does not pick up again, the reality is that Europe would have to, and it simply doesn't, it didn't have the political will. Now I think it has the political will, but it doesn't have the capacity. It would have to double the speed and volume at which it is um, producing and supplying aid to Ukraine. So that's unlikely to happen. And that means there's a certain scenario on the horizon that that combination might force Ukraine to negotiate something that will never um, resemble any kind of real peace. Um, what we also see in terms of implications that I think there's a change of Western and European perspectives on the, on the region, sort of not seeing Eastern Europe as this diffuse mass and then we mostly see um, Russia. Um, this is also, I think, is translated and rightly so into all kinds of different spheres. Also. We were discussing it early on into, into academic spheres, um, uh, which parts of the region get um, noticed in titles of programs or in research projects and what people study and what they study first and, and what they maybe need to know about as well. So I think this is a, um, a more lasting change. So it doesn't mean anything yet for, the, how this, for how this war will end, but it means something about the, the change of perceptions
Um, I don't know if you can subscribe to that in the US, but in Europe, that is definitely um, the, um, the overarching perception. So this is what one could call, and I would call, decolonization of, of perceptions and policies. But it also comes with rethinking um, security. So for many countries in, in, in Europe, and Germany probably the main one among them, thinking again about military security and having um, a role to play in this in, in Europe is, is really a, a very big shift, which in the eyes of the public actually happened quite quickly for government, not necessarily quickly enough for Ukraine. And then there's the horribly difficult question of Ukraine after the war. What will Ukraine look like after the war? Clearly, we don't know yet. The issue is about um, a territory, which parts of the territory, all of its 1991 territory, or which parts will be, sorry, will be um, under, under Ukraine's um, control. What does reconstruction, and Ukrainians call, or put more emphasis on recovery, because that also has a more social um, dynamic to it. Um, the dimensions are enormous. Uh, now there are attempts to link that to EU accession, but that again does not um, uh, clarify yet uh, that these logics of these processes could also point in somewhat different directions, reconstruction and EU accession. And the issue of security guarantees for Ukraine currently mostly handled at the level of bilateral agreements um, is, is not really solved with that. And the, the aspect that I will probably observe um, more out of those in, in the coming months and years is the political landscape and state society relations in Ukraine. So we have in front of us now um, a society that is, um, that is obviously hugely impacted by the, by the war and changed. And when people make references to, or oh, will Ukraine be as corrupt as, as it was before and so on, it really misunderstands that at the moment there is no political landscape. Um, I mean, there is a, a very streamlined decision-making process. Politics are just beginning in various corners. But whatever it exactly looks like, the political landscape, it will look very different from what it was before 2022. Um, so there, there could be new oligarchs, different interests. Probably there's going to be many interests and, and also um, individuals uh, with certain experiences during the war or at the front that will shape politics. There will be um, a huge number of vulnerable groups that need to be somehow be part of um, reconstruction, um, if not, or that can hardly um, be, be achieved quickly. So those, I think, will be the main, probably put simply, probably the main divisions will be around questions of where were you during the war and what did you do during the war? Also keeping in mind that um, uh, Altogether, about 14 million Ukrainians have been on the move. 10 million moved outside. Some have moved um, back again since, but the vast majority of those who moved outside is still outside of Ukraine. Questions around possible return or not return. So the whole social structure of the country is currently out of sync as well. Um, um, so those will be um, huge issues for, for the country, even if the territory can be regained. And also the questions of what Russia will look like after the war. So basically, often there's a lot of really complicated scenarios, but I think it's actually quite simple. So either a status quo or a change, and then change is harder to, um, at the moment, envisage, and there's no imminent sign of any change happening. But it could revolve around just the inner core of the system. It could be a wider elite struggle or elites and society, but society will come last. So any ho I think any hope um, of society stirring up change in Russia in the current uh, system is extremely unlikely. So it will have to be some sort of an elite struggle, which is not inconceivable if um, the war is long and obviously costs are incurred in Russia too. And then there's a the big question, and I will not try to answer it, that we feel that we are at, um, we were discussing this as well, um, at a moment where there is a wider regional international reordering going on, but we don't know quite where in which direction. And maybe just to end here, um, maybe someone, a new Cyril Black, will have to write another book about rebirth after after a big a big war, but a, a different war. So maybe that's a, a book forthcoming that we need in the future. So thank you very much. So I'm going to say a few things about the book, but I think it might be best if we just sat down okay. here. Yeah, because uh, most of what I'm going to say is going to be uh, questions.
Okay, well, Gwen, thank you for that fantastic overview of the book uh, and the major themes in it. Uh, and uh, so let me warmly welcome you here. It's great to have you here. Um, you know, I think this is an extremely useful book, uh, an uh, enormously useful book. Uh, I think, personally, it's the best book that's out there uh, on um, the full-scale invasion, the background to the full-scale invasion. It's succinct also. Uh, and, you know, I would strongly recommend if you haven't read it, that you do. Um, there are things that I learn even in the book. Uh, and so I think every, even experts will learn something from, from the book. So um, it's thoughtful. It's well-informed. Uh, it's very judicious in its appraisals, uh, which I think is, you know, in a topic like this, is such an, an, an achievement. Um, the other thing is it's very eloquently written. And for a book that was translated from German back into English, I mean, that's a big achievement, right? <laughs> so, uh, so one of the great um, you know, attributes of this book is it not only um, details for us the history and the driving forces uh, behind the Russian invasion, the full-scale Russian invasion, uh, but it also lays bare, I think, many of the inaccuracies, uh, many of the inaccuracies that particularly the Kremlin has tried to propagate about why it invaded, um, and about also uh, many of the inaccuracies about uh, Ukrainian politics and society, and inaccuracies about Russian politics and society, too. Um, the book also highlights some of Gwen's groundbreaking research, which is, you know, great how she integrated it into, into the book, so her earlier work on Crimea um, and her amazing public opinion research that she did in Donbass on both sides of the conflict, uh, the continuing public opinion research, some of which you saw here. Uh, I mean, the work that she's done has been quite unusual, uh, and uh, quite unusual for not just in the context of Ukraine, but when you think about doing that kind of work across the, you know, the dividing lines of the war, um, it's quite amazing. And then she's done incredible work on emigration as well, uh, which also, you know, finds some reflection uh, in the book and on protest participation, on civil society development. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, I, the book also, I would say, kind of reflects her role as director of the center that she directs. Uh, that she's the founding director of, of. That center has had a remarkable growth um, and, and is now you know, really one of the leading centers uh, on East European politics uh, in the world uh, under her direction. Uh, and finally, you know, Gwen is, uh, is a major figure uh, in terms of giving advice to the German government uh, as well. Uh, they don't hear me necessarily. <laughs> they don't hear it. Well, they never hear it. I mean, governments never hear it. But nevertheless, she does give advice, and um, you know you can you can sense the sort of uh, the the judicious policy element that's that's underlying uh, what she's saying in the book. Um, I presume that's similar to what she's done in her academic work. Uh, so I uh, let me congratulate her. So the book, of course, was written. Uh, I think the English version was probably early 2023. I know the Purgosian. Uh, mm -hmm. Bund hadn't yet taken place uh, at the time that the book was published. Uh, but uh, it was at a time of somewhat greater optimism about the war. Um, you know, more recently, uh, with the failure of the counteroffensive in uh, the last summer, uh, and there, there's kind of a sense that things have turned a little more south. Uh, and Russia's gaining ground gradually uh, in the east. Uh, you know, now that uh, anti-missile missiles and other defenses are scarce, uh, in large part because of the lack of American aid, uh, you know, much of the Ukrainian power, power grid has been you know, taken out. Um, there are parts of Ukraine that previously had been liberated, which are now starting to come in under attack. So I know you're really very reticent to speculate about the future, 
Um, but I think it's sort of like got a pro perspective on it. So, how realistic is it really for Ukraine to win win this war? And what is it that that means? In that case? What does it mean for Ukraine to win this war? I answer now. Uh, first of all, thank you. I uh, haven't heard so many nice words about my book uh, uh, at all, actually. Um, I personally don't use the word winning the war and victory. So, and I don't know what that means, quite frankly. And uh, is this winning if we're looking at the amount of destruction and the people lost uh, um, to this war? Um, but I mean, one interpretation of winning would be restoring the boundaries, the borders of Ukraine as of 1991, including Crimea. That's how um, Ukraine would define it at the moment. That's how Ukrainians define it. And while uh, sometimes a lot is made of the fact that a slightly higher or a somewhat higher number of people now um, don't answer, uh, there can't be any uh, territorial concessions. So recent polling has that at about sort of 19, 20%. If you dig deeper, you see that those people also say that will only happen if the West doesn't support us enough. So that's a slightly different interpretation of the, even the 20%. But even the 20% weren't there um, uh, a year ago. So it does indicate something. It doesn't um, indicate that people see a, an alternative at the moment in Ukraine to this. So sometimes this being tired of the war, this term, this terminology is used a lot, I think, in the West. It's and in Ukraine, people are very tired, but they know they have no other alternative. They know exactly what happens when this war, um, when they stop fighting. So then there's actually, then there, there is no Ukraine um, as we know it. And even ideas about, um, maybe you hear them more in Germany because as a historical analogy, um, recently people have talked more about freezing the war in a way that East and West Germany were divided. And then maybe it takes a very long time but then eventually things could change. And that's for any historian even, uh, or even non-historian and not a historian, that's a complete non-starter because we know for sure, we don't know how the war will end, uh, whether Ukraine will be able to define anything as a victory, but we know for sure that on the other side of the line, there won't be any Ukraine anymore. So that, that we know for sure. And that's definitely not anything that comes under winning. Huh? It might still be the reality, and I think I outlined what I think is the main factor in forcing Ukraine at some point to negotiate and basically keep control of what it has control of at the moment. But if that happens, um, uh, I think all the um, indicators are there that Russia is not going to stop at that point. So it's never going to be at this point. It might be a necessity at some point for Ukraine. Hopefully not, but it might be um, entirely and it's not a done deal, so the West can do something about it. There is time to do something about it. Um, uh, but if that doesn't happen, um, and there is some negotiation, some attempt to freeze, we can be sure that it starts again after a certain time. So I think when we look into the future, while it's unclear how Ukraine will look and how much of its territory really can be regained, looking in the other direction, things are pretty clear. Um, because uh, it would, at all, it would only give Russia time to regroup, um, because obviously costs are high on the on the on the Russian side as well, and then start again at a later point in in time. So if we think these occupied territories currently, um, they're also some of them are they're not even clearly delineated. So they're somewhere in the south in Kherson, Zaporizhia, in in the south of of Ukraine and in the and in the east. So that's a very long long answer to to a question that I really don't know the answer to, but um, for Ukraine winning would mean regaining all its territory, but I have some question marks over that, whether that's possible. But that doesn't mean it's not the same as saying that now is the time to negotiate over that, because that I think would clearly not work and not be any sustainable peace. And also Ukrainians would not, at the moment, would not support it. So the, there's also not stability in Ukraine that follows from that. And no political leader in Ukraine could, um, could even begin to do that now. Okay, um, let, me, let me turn to Russia a little bit. So uh, in your presentation, uh, in your presentations, you talked uh, uh, more about the continuities uh, than the changes that have, have happened in Russia. Um, you know, were there not alternatives uh, in that Russia or alternative paths that Russia might have followed? Uh, and, um, you know, 
or was it destined to be imperialist? Uh, was it destined to ta mm. attack Ukraine all the way back, you know, in the 1990s? Um, you know, do you understand from from your presentation, one could walk away and say, "Oh, this war was inevitable," mm -hmm. even going back into the, the 1990s. Yeah, no, that's an important point, and that's why my list of why this war happened was so long. No, and it was processes, and none of them I see as a as the one cause or even collectively, um, they made the war of these dimensions more likely, is the argument. But um, it's exactly an argument against a deterministic explanation of that this had to happen and this was inevitable. You're right, when you stress continuities, um, uh, one could think, does that then make it ine inevitable? But no, I mean, it just means there were continuities in um, how the Russian political system evolved, but um, that doesn't mean that this extent of a reaction against a neighbor would have to would have to follow. No? Um, and also, uh, uh, I mean, having other wars and in, in neighboring countries that Russia plays a part in, but it plays a different part in, in, in many of them. And that's enough sometimes to destabilize, sometimes to uh, quite literally get territory back. Um, so far, mostly it's been about political um, influence, but also also territory in some places. Um, so I think there's a range of options that can follow. Um, what I was trying to argue against is that it's not, um, some people have said, okay, it's now all of a sudden Russia is all so neo-imperial and needs to get um, a kind of um, a former power back. But that had never completely left. In the very first few years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, clearly Russia is regionally, internationally weakened and is busy with itself. Um, has to also really work hard at keeping the so-called Russian Federation together. But then um, uh, in terms of the internal narratives, uh, the history school books, uh, there, there, is, there is more continuity in how Russia was seen as a great um, state or empire before and how that continued. So that's what I was um, what I would like to wanted to emphasize, but that could still mean different um, different paths and uh, without, what actually also happened um, domestically in Ukraine. Again, that that Russia could have evolved, would have had very different relationships if, if Ukraine hadn't made it so clear that they wanted to move in other directions. So I think there's a lot of other other factors around it that, that go against this inevitability. Um, but without seeing the continuities, it seems like too too sudden and, and actually deflects from the fact that certain patterns were in place. Or if we look at um, even Putin's own rhetoric. I mean, he told us for many years now where this is going. Again, not with the exact outcome and the exact dimensions. And he himself didn't, I think, foresee these dimensions. He thought it would be over when much more quickly. When he made the decision to invade Ukraine? In full scale? Full scale invasion. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, yes, I don't know. It's a, it's a typical question. What goes on in Putin's head? I don't, and we don't know. Um, well, I think you could, I mean, one could judge that by things on the ground. Yeah, I mean, what, what was being done? I mean, what what's obvious is, and from then on, I think it was obvious that something big would happen. Again, not that we would think it's a it's a multi year long war, maybe, but as as they were building up the troops on the on the Russian Ukrainian border, so that happened from the summer of 2023. So if you have over a hundred thousand troops lining that border. You don't just do that for show. Lots of people said it is for show, and it was already testing probably. But then that is the last moment I think when when you know something big is going to happen. How big is not it wasn't clear until the, maybe the last moment. Um, and I think it's part of a this process. I think in 2014, uh, as I say, I don't know what Putin was really thinking, but I, I don't think the whole kind of the next few years can all be clear, but it's also a testing, no? It's testing the room for maneuver, and yes, you get away with more or less with the annexation. Donbass is sort of, um, the war in Donbass is, is really weakening Ukraine um, uh, politically, but nevertheless, all the indications of where Ukraine is, is, is going continue, and you know that the West and, and, and Europe in particular still needs you and uh, has, um, very very close economic links increases that space. No? So I think it's moving towards that. And then there are there are some people who say that in COVID times, Putin read too much history um, and mm -hmm. had ambitions that uh, came out of history documents that he, he that he had delivered to him. But that seems a little too simple. But the the bit about Putin that actually remains um, 
surprising to me, the aspect that's most surprising to me and says, I think, a lot about also the arrogance of an imperial power that clearly you can frame your narrative about Ukraine um, and that it doesn't even exist historically and it's an artificial construct and all the rest of it. You can make generations, in, in, in the meantime, generations of schools, children kind of learn that, not just since 2022, um, but did you actually believe all of that yourself and you risk a war of, of these dimensions? You actually think, and that seemed to be what at least the pictures conveyed to us, that uh, you really thought he would arrive in or the troops would arrive in Kiev quickly and they would be welcomed there. So that actually is, is uh, I think, one of the most surprising elements and say, I think, a lot about that you can actually really misunderstand it or you start believing your own rhetoric. But I think it's something even more than that. Um, so, yeah. So... Uh why don't I ask one last question? Because I'm sure there are plenty of questions in the audience. But I, you know, when I give talks on Ukraine, I, I always get somebody in the audience who says, "Well, what is? Why does this fight, you know, matter for people in the United States?" And of course, you see that sentiment reflected in mm -hmm. uh, certain people uh, in <laughs> Congress. Um, so, what would you tell them? Yes, I mean, the argument is maybe um, easier to make uh, in, in Europe, but it matters immediately. This is an issue of security in Europe, and uh, the U.S. has an important role in this as well. And even if the U.S. thinks, and probably rightly thinks, that the main challenge will be China, um, not, in a way, stopping Russia now signals that both Russia and other actors, like China, have a lot of room. Um, so I think um, it, it's in the self-interest, even if you, which I don't entirely buy, that it's also only going to be about China. But even if you use that argument and you believe that argument, um, then not stopping Russia now doing this will is clearly signal something to other powerful authoritarian leaders and, and states. Um, and at least I've grown up also with, with the U.S. that has an interest also in security in Europe. So I haven't really quite given up on, on that argument either. Because Europe itself, I mean, it's 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 slowly wakening up in some parts of Europe or the Na or NATO in Europe or or the EU more than others. But um, it, it's not it's not going to be possible without the US in the foreseeable future. Okay. Good. Uh, do you want to, shall we uh, field some questions then? Thank you so much for the presentation and for the book as well. Uh, one of the questions that I wanted to ask is you, you, you talked about these sort of changes in civic identity and, uh, and, and sort of language and so on. And having looked at, at these, uh, these sort of survey data uh, going backwards, what's sort of interesting is that you see it with the revolution of dignity. You see this increase in, uh, in uh, civic identity that is not mirrored by an increase in linguistic practice uh, and so on. And similarly, you, you see the sort of similar jump actually during the Orange Revolution. But you hinted in, uh, in your talk that this might have changed now. Mm -hmm. So based on your survey data, do you see significant changes in the, the willingness of people to speak Russian, in the willingness of people to sort of tolerate Russian being mm -hmm. spoken and so on? I mean, I, I, are we seeing a re-ethnicization of this? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, oh, so sorry, we're collecting, right? Or no? I don't know why I can answer, by the way. Well, why don't you answer that? Yeah. Um, more. Yes, thank you. Very, very important question. And I, I have not fielded a recent survey. I'm about to. And that question, I'm interested in to see if one can pick it up. Other surveys um, have not shown a dramatic shift yet. So there are still people actually more or less in the same numbers. And maybe you've looked at the same survey data um, saying that they speak Russian or that they, they're, they're um, native language is often a category used, although that's also sometimes a symbolic category, that they still use that. Um, where if surveys have asked about what language you use in public places, which is not a typical question, so usually the questions are either just the general question, what's your native language, but then um, also lots of Russian speakers have increasingly said also before 2022 Ukrainian, so that's also obviously a symbolic category. Um, then the typical more nuanced way was to ask, what do you speak at work? What do you speak at, at home? Um, and then you see a lot of um, sort of bilingualism. And now some surveys have added public places, and there you really see um, Ukrainian. So it's um, 
I think it's understandable in the dynamics, but whether that will actually, um, I think that would be a more gradual process. I think more people make an effort and that highlights the fact that it's absolutely possible for the vast majority of Ukrainians to speak both. Um, it was just a, a choice or one has grown up more with one or the other. So it's not a very difficult jump. Um, but what that means going forward, if there's a gradual process that actually uh, that will push out that identification with that language, let it keeping away the, the question of that. I don't think it was a conflict ever. Um, it seems, and but that's more anecdotal evidence that that is the case, but I don't have an answer yet. And I think it will be a more gradual trend and probably depends also on what happens one day after the war, what kind of policies are in place then. But it's feasible, I think. But I personally, I can't quite imagine that nobody would speak Russian anymore in Ukraine either. Um, thank you for Thank you for, for the presentation and for the book. I haven't read it yet, but I, I will. Um, last year I was in Berlin at the Wissenschaftskolleg and uh, I could feel the difference. Of course, in, in Germany, in Berlin, this war feels so much closer than here. So I totally understand that. Uh, of course, there is a huge difference in public opinion about the war in, in Germany and here. Um, and, but my question is about uh, also maybe, uh, I don't know to what extent you talk about it in, in your book, about the attitude of Europe to to the situation and especially to the different, the subtle kind of aspects of that. We had a talk here a few months, uh, a couple of months ago by Lina Rybakova, who works on the problem of export control and sanctions. And what, um, what became clear from her talk that there are two kind of sides of this uh, European policies towards um, uh, Ukraine and, and towards Russia, mostly, of course, not Ukraine. One side is more public, is like uh, maybe donating weapons or money or just supporting diplomatically. But another is this, uh, really engaging in this very subtle but constant, persistent efforts to prevent Russia from producing weapons and, and, and or generating income. And this policy is not so, it doesn't produce so much of the public effect for, for like European societies. And it also requires surprisingly more, um, uh, how to say, more sacrifices because it means uh, really um, like making some of the steps that may threaten the economic securities of European states themselves. So to what extent do you think this uh, in Germany or elsewhere in Europe, there is this readiness to really engage seriously in, in a very ser like a very deep level in um, trying to restrict Russia's access to, to the markets, to the, uh, in both sense of selling oil or gas, but also buying um, things for, for the production of weapons. Mm -hmm. Is there the change and uh, going on and how the state of war affects this attitude? Yes. Should we, mm -hmm. should we collect a couple okay. because mm -hmm. I think then yep. we have about uh, three, two hours, so a little more time. Okay. That, that was Ms. Kuba. That, was, was, a, that was a meeting question. question. We couldn't hear. Want to just say the last one? Yeah, the last one. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize. It was, uh, so, so the the question was about the attitude of the European politicians and the public to sanctions and uh, against Russia. Um, yes, thanks for the question. Um, obviously, there, are, as with any sanctions, I think uh, historically. Um, there are loopholes and uh, there are business interests and not all the sanctions work. And plus Russia has um, uh, reacted in a way that has uh, also limited uh, the effect of it and has found also other ways of reorienting itself. So the overall effect, I think there still is an effect, um, but the effect is also, as always with sanctions too, is, is, um, is a more gradual one and doesn't affect kind of the war right away. Um, uh, so the, the record is definitely mixed and also more recently, um, in recent days, there have been investigations of which um, European companies are still um, heavily involved and, um, and, and benefiting. But there is a huge change. Again, Ukrainians would say it's, it doesn't go far enough. Um, but, uh, I mean, to give the example of Germany, I mean, within record time, they could basically... 
free themselves from Russian oil and gas, and the public went along with it and thought it was necessary and it's possible. The question is, why wasn't that possible earlier? Um, um, and in many other countries, um, they, they've cut these links as well. So these sanctions are far-reaching. And, and in 2014, uh, there's evidence that the Kremlin in 2014, with the first EU sanctions, um, and then again with the war in Donbass, was surprised that the EU could also as a whole, it's not, on, or not only individual countries doing something, could even enact any kinds of sanctions. But now compared to then, um, you can see that there's so much more that they, they then were willing and able to do. No? So that it's a, it's a range. Nobody would have thought that feasible in, in 2014. So I think the, the rethink has been major in, 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 in all parts of um, Europe. Well, maybe not in Hungary and maybe not so much in Slovakia, but uh, in Austria. Okay, so but nevertheless, um, <laughs> it highlights the problem that actually if you get everybody together inside the EU, it's, it's always difficult. But nevertheless, that's a that's a big rethink. That's as big as uh, um, what I highlighted before. That uh, even in, at the end of February, that wasn't your question now, but it fits, I think, in, in the answer. Um, already at the end of February 2022, um, a vast majority of of, of Germans uh, considered military support for Ukraine necessary. So that's historically that's um, that's a very quick shift, and it was the society was ahead of politics continuously. So that highlights big sh changes. But um, there is still variation, and yes, from here, obviously, everything has to geographically, historically, seem so much further. I would say that before 2022, also from Berlin, which isn't really all that far away from Poland and Ukraine, it seemed very far away. So the geographical distance was still surprisingly big in people's heads. That has changed, but it has changed, um, or maybe it has changed uh, for Germany and some other European countries, it has reinforced what um, was already uh, the common perception in, for example, the Baltic states. So, so, and you see that and hear that in the language that uh, the Baltic states talk about their security in, uh, is being um, fought over in Ukraine. In Germany, it's still um, kind of the war in Ukraine or Russia's war against Ukraine, if it's even the correct labeling. But it still signals it's it's not really all seen as our our war. No? So there's still distinctions, also historically, I think, um, uh, determined distinctions. But I would think the, the, the shift in thinking and also what the publics have supported, it's not, for example, in Germany, it's not the war is not the main issue around right wing populism right now. It, it plays into it at times, but it's it's not. It's interesting. It's It's not so. Society has um, supported that, but if that going forward and how long that can be the case, um, I, I don't know. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, uh, All right. Thank you very much. My name is Isabella, I'm a grad student in the politics department. I'm a fan of your work, and I look forward to reading the book, especially after such high praise from Mark. Um, and I want to bring together a couple points that you raised during your talk. Uh, one is sort of you alluded to the post-war po political situation in Ukraine and how some of the sort of questions of where were you and what were you doing might and will certainly affect politics afterward. And you also mentioned 10 million more people who have left the country internally displaced huge, probably an incalculable number. And so clearly the war has had an impact on everyone in Ukraine, but some people have felt the impacts more acutely than others, certainly. And some people have had the means to get out. And I don't think anyone in this room, and I certainly would never, you know, fault anyone for getting themselves and their families out of a desperate situation. But I wonder how you think um, the question of people who left versus people who stayed, people who fought versus people who didn't, and whether you could elaborate a little bit more about that and and also the question of you know who's in the sort of line of fire more so than others and how that will color Ukrainian politics going forward. All right, then I, I'll jump in. I also have a question about society and state society relations. In a way it goes back to uh, Grigo's opening question. Can you hear? Yeah. So you said two things also that I found really interesting. One was about the, the strengthening in a way of civil society, both in terms of volunteering and in terms of protest. But then uh, maybe 10 minutes later, you talked about the fact that there was no political landscape. Mm -hmm. And so I'd love to hear a little bit more about how those two things come together and what that 
what that implies in terms of politics under this current situation, and if one can imagine in a post-war situation what that would mean if there is no political landscape, how does one imagine the channeling of protest and volunteering into politics? Thank you very much. Great questions. Um, on the first one, um, that's I mean, in a way, that's exactly what I meant. I think that will be one of uh, really difficult and painful sort of cleavages in society, and you can already, at times, um, even even hear it now. I mean, that's not what I do research on, but anecdotally, uh, for example, Ukrainian scholars outside reflect that a lot already. Sort of that they think. Um, their voice, even their expertise, advising anybody is not as sought after as, as people inside Ukraine. So they are, they are formulating this, I, I can't judge, um, that they don't think there will be much of a space for them in this process. Um, um, I don't know if, if that's true or not, but even the president, even President Zelensky has at times used this rhetoric, um, which... I would think is a dangerous rhetoric in, 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 at this moment in time to say those who left and those who stayed. So that already highlights, I think, some of the um, uh, kind of yeah, potential friction around that. But um, depending on how, how much longer it lasts, I think that can only sort of gather in, in speed and in force and will be something that has to, I think, be, be managed. And sometimes I hear from like Western policymakers or donors thinking about reconstruction, yes, the key thing will be to bring everybody back. You know, somehow that seems to be a, a reflex after wars. Now in the Western Balkans, that was always like return of all the refugees. And, and we see that's not what really happens. And, and return also means different things, you know, and coming and going. As now, displacement, by the way, means coming and going. You know, these people are not permanently in one place. They keep moving between different places and they also go frequently back to Ukraine and out. So it's a its displacement doesn't maybe perhaps um, capture it. And, and I think the much more difficult thing will be and much more creative thing will be to, to find ways of involving these, well, by then maybe not 10 million people, but uh, with their capacities uh, to to um, help the country rebuild. No? But that's a very different kind of thinking and that could go against this easy kind of in and out um, type of um, distinction. But there are some indications that that's already um, on people's minds and it's also understandable in some ways that it is on people's minds and I think people outside feel also the also probably typical of wars that feeling of guilt no? that they're not part of of, of the fighting in, in, in Ukraine um, and the, the last question there on uh, Deborah on, very good question and uh, I think that's that's actually really pointing to one of the major challenges because I, I didn't want to and I hope I don't in this book um, um, sort of sound uh, uh, sort of too uh, positive about civil society in, in Ukraine. A lot It's become a certain phrase that there was always a strong, or not always, but since 2004, 2013, 14, a strong civil society in Ukraine and all this volunteering on top of that. But that also has, and I, I didn't say that right now, so thanks for giving me the opportunity to do that now. It's also a compensatory mechanism. So they do this because certain things don't function in the state or didn't function and why uh, and it also because it was often very hard for civil society then to kind of also move into politics or or, or, or shape politics. So it was some of it is is not to be idealized, but also replaced uh, functions that, that that the state should really um, in a, in a democracy also be um, involved in. And so that also means that what does that mean for uh, for the future? That um, can civil society can the volunteering be channeled into? some of the new political parties, um, where will they come from, on what basis? Uh, so I think it's an open question, but I think probably the central one, and it's tied to another one that I didn't mention now, but in the book it features, um, in addition to this question of where were you doing the war, and, and that will be important, or vulnerable people being, being part of a re reconstruction effort, um, will be the question what happens in terms of centralization and decentralization. And I'm not, I don't mean a turn back towards complete authoritarianism, but clearly at the moment it's a it's a it's a very centralized system. And how could it not be in a in a war? Um, maybe some of you followed the discussions about should there be elections now or not. Um, maybe we don't have time to discuss it now. I don't think the argument is for having elections now. It could not really be proper democratic elections, so you might as well not not have them right now. But you will have to have them again at some point. Um, and will there be, against the backdrop of weak political institutions that were always weak, the parliament was weak and was further 
hollowed out uh, over time. And now you don't even really have the political forces that were still in parliament. Um, so it's that's one of the key questions. And you have another potential corrective that the process of decentralization, so giving more power to the local level, was well underway. And also locally, it's a big country, so there's, there's variation. But also because of the, the, the war effort, you see certain things against this backdrop of, of, um, sort of legal uh, processes around and, and political processes around decentralization are actually functioning or having to function quite well. So is that the, um, and you could only rebuild the country politically, economically, with that important dimension in place. And will that be enough as a corrective to something that looks entirely centralized at, at the moment at the top um, is the other dimension, which is part of that. And then, of course, locally now, different actors that before also didn't always um, cooperate or having to cooperate, uh, um, be it the mayor, local business, civil society, so in, in rebuilding infrastructure or these kinds of things. And so that could be one way of, of linking it and into into the political system. But I think that's an, an open question as well, in which way, how centralized or decentralized the system will be. Okay. Let me just say a few things. First off, we're so um, delighted that you were able to come both to share this book and to share your insight and to puzzle through these questions, which are so pressing and important as we think about going forward. Before we give a warm applause for, for this um, talk and conversation, I want to note that, first of all, we have the book <laughs> outside. Labyrinth is here. Um, so for those who would like to, um, to uh, look through the book and pick up the book, uh, thanks to Labyrinth, they're here. Second, I want to thank Kimberly Bitterman, who helped to make all of this possible, both arranging for the um, for today's event and also coordinating with Labyrinth. So I want to thank you for, for all that you've done. I want to thank Mark, who, as always, is you know a brilliant uh, discussant and interlocutor. That was so fun to hear um, the conversation. And a special, special warm thanks to you, Gwendolyn, thank you. for coming and not only flying and giving this talk, but really for helping us understand what seems to be an impossibly complicated scenario, not only historically, but mm -hmm. going forward. You've given a kind of clarity and insight. So I think we all want to give a warm applause. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.